Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. May God bless this reading of his word. Let's pray one more time. Father in heaven, We thank you for internet connections and Wi-Fi and websites and apps and all of these things that allow us to continue to be a church, hearing your word and worshiping you. But all of these pale in comparison to you, Holy Spirit. Though we aren't present with each other, you are present with each and every one of us. And you... Just bring us together and give us one purpose, one passion right now, to see Jesus glorified, lifted high in our ears, in our hearts and minds. So bless us now. Bless all the children who are with their parents watching this service. Give them just engagement, peace, stillness, so that they can also listen and hear. And Lord, make of me clear and engaging so that your word, and your desire for us comes through. We thank you, Father, for your great love, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Two guys hiking in the woods. All of a sudden, they see a huge bear appear 50 feet before them. One of the guys slowly bends down and starts tightening his shoelaces The other guy incredulously whispers down to him, what are you doing? You're not faster than the bear. The other guy finishes lacing his sneakers and whispers back, I don't need to be faster than the bear. Do you get the joke? I mean, it's a pretty terrible joke. Pastor John taught it to me. So (laughs) um, so the guy's just saying, I just have to be faster than you. And this joke captures a big part of the human condition. We're always trying to see where we stack up. We're always trying to see where we rate against others. The size of our house, the size of our 401k, uh, the, our tax bracket, seniors, where you're getting into college this year. Uh, so just for kids still in school, not getting picked last in gym class like this guy always was. Or uh, maybe the size of your (laughs) toilet paper supply. White people, you crack me up. Um, So that's what Bruno Mars was singing about in Uptown Funk. So that's the white gold, not cocaine, toilet paper. (laughs) Go on missions, or ask me, you'll know what to do. You're always trying to see where you are against other people. Not because, you, not because you want to see yourself accurately at the bottom. You want to see yourself as better. You want to angle for a promotion or increase in status, standing, how you look in other people's eyes. And this drives us, all of us. This comes from a sinful place that doesn't see Jesus correctly and doesn't see our sin correctly either. And we teach at our church that unless you see both correctly, you can't see at all. So Jesus is using a prop here, a visual aid to help us understand these three points. It's the disciples' turn to represent us. Trust in Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and humble yourself and bravely go after the lost. First point, it's the disciples' turn to represent us. We've seen Peter represent us already, haven't we? In his wonderful and accurate confession, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And also in his huge failure resulting in Jesus telling him, get behind me, Satan. 
We're not done with Peter. He's going to do it again later in this gospel, but this time it's all the disciples getting in on the action. They're all representing us, and we need to get used to the understanding that they are included not as heroes or even as cautionary tales, but to represent us because we do and we feel and we think the things that they do. They're like the hobbits in The Lord of the Rings. Did you know that in the first draft of The Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien did not have the hobbits in there. He wrote them in later. Why? Because he knew people could not relate to just the heroes, these legends like Aragorn or Legolas or Gimli. They needed a way to see themselves in the story. And so the hobbits were meant to represent the readers, ordinary people. And these disciples, they represent us. And what were the disciples doing in this passage? See, this uh, chapter 1 starts, at that time. Do you remember what Jesus was just doing with them? Not just pa- last week when Pastor John was preaching about the temple tax and Peter asking the questions and then going and fishing and getting the, the money and the fish. Jesus was just telling them the game plan, that he was going to Jerusalem, that he would be just humiliated, persecuted, put to death, and then rise from the dead. He was giving them the game plan, and the previous chapter says they, the disciples, were greatly distressed. But now what are they doing? Matthew jumps right in and makes it sound like they went straight to Jesus to to ask him this question. But we can tell from Mark 9 and Luke 9 that Jesus knew what they were talking about. They weren't talking in front of him. He knew because he's God. He knows. And he calls them out. What are you talking about? And then they bring their mealy mouth question to him. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And we should all just be going, ugh, just face plant. Because they knew Jesus was the Messiah, and that he had come. But they actually liked the old system, the old religious system of leaders being in charge. Think about this. They went from being sad and distressed. They don't understand the resurrection that Jesus is talking about yet. They just understand that he's just said that he's going to go off to die. They're sad, but then, ding, it dawns on them. Wait, there's an opportunity here. Power vacuum. And so they started their opposition research right then and there. Oh, it can't be Peter. He just got called Satan. What about James and John? They're with Jesus all the time. Nah, they're mama's boys. Yeah, we're going to see that later. They were looking forward to being the new leaders. And this comes from pride and self-righteousness, a sense of entitlement and deserving that says that we have something to contribute and God would be lucky to have our participation in his plans. Maybe we're not as blatantly as arrogant as that. But any time we think, I've been good, so God is going to be good to me, or God is going to answer this prayer of mine, or uh, I'm not going to ask for this yet. I'm not going to pray for this yet until I've been better. We're showing we have the same kind of heart, this prideful heart that brings us all the way back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve wanted something of God apart from him. See, the disciples wanted to play king of the hill, and Jesus, out of his great love, has to rip that error apart. See, James Boyce said, instead of answering them only on that level of the question they're asking, Jesus explains that unless they possessed a nature that was entirely different from what they were betraying by their question, they would not even enter the kingdom. Forget about who was going to be the most important, Jesus said. What they needed to worry about was being in the kingdom at all. They were so far off. Because if Jesus is Jesus to you, these aren't the things you're concerned with. 
And John Calvin gives us all this warning. If the, if the apostles so soon forgot a discourse which they had just heard, what will become of us if, dismissing for a long period of meditation on the cross, we give ourselves up to indifference and sloth or to idle speculations? Jack Miller paraphrases this, I think, when he says, we have to preach the, we have to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. We have to start with this thought from Psalm 40, verse 17. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. See, this is what Jesus was talking about way back in when we started this last year in Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you remember what that means? Pastor John taught us to be poor in spirit. In, it, that it's not to lack money, but to acknowledge spiritual bankruptcy. It confesses one's unworthiness before God and utter dependence on Him. D.A. Carson says, those who are so poor, they know they can offer nothing and do not try. They cry for mercy, and they alone are heard. So, in fact, uh, in, verse, in Matthew 5, 5, Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And J Martin Lloyd-Jones says that this meekness is applying our understanding of spiritual poverty to others. This is what C.S. Lewis meant when he wrote, The load, the weight, the burden of my neighbor's glory should be laid daily on my back, a load so heavy that only humility can carry it, and the backs of the proud will be broken. So Jesus rebukes his beloved disciples and explained to them what life in the kingdom is like and what they have to do, which is point two. Trust in Jesus Christ, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What is Jesus talking about? What does he mean when he says that? And how are we supposed to do that? You know, many adults are acting like children, especially nowadays when you see, go to BJ's or Costco and see just, oh, let's buy this stuff and that, let's stock up. So some of you will be using that toilet paper until just, I don't know, for the next 20 years. Have fun. Are they doing it right? No. He's not telling us to behave like children or even to think like them. Other times the Bible even says don't think like or don't be like children, be mature. But he's pointing out something that's a little unfamiliar to us today. In the age of helicopter parents where we hover, ready to just swoop in when our kids need... Actually, I heard that we're not helicopter parents anymore. We're lawnmower parents. We mow down any obstacle in front of our kids that gets in their way. You know, the joke is from The Simpsons, like over 10 years ago, I think. Won't somebody please think of the children? See, back then, in the ancient days... Children had no status in the ancient world. People didn't do things for the children. The best way to think of children was seen and not heard. And then out of sight, out of mind, so you're not even thinking about them. I kind of experienced this growing up as a pastor's kid in a Korean church. As a kid of a pastor, we'd get a lot of calls from adults, from, pastor, uh, from the other elders and pastors. And so I'd answer the phone because back then we didn't all have like, you know, just our own phone, right? So you'd answer the phone and they'd ask, is your father home? It's like, no, he's not. Click. <laughs> just got hung up on all the stinking time, especially by this one elder. So just, uh, I love him now, but, you know, just none of our elders are like this. But so is he home? No. Click. And in this small example, small way, we tap into the understanding of children back then having no status, no importance. But where is Jesus headed with this analogy? 
We get a glimpse of this in Luke 22, verse 24, where a similar episode, a dispute also arose among them, his followers, as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And you can imagine what they're bragging about. I've healed this kind of sickness. Well, yeah, well, I've drove out this kind of, kind of demon. Well, I've preached Jesus' message to this many people. And Jesus says to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest. Again, no, no status. And the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at the table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. And didn't Jesus show us this at the Last Supper, where he gets up, takes off his outer garments, wraps a towel around his waist, gets the basin of water, kneels down, and washes his disciples' filthy feet. And again, the disciples are stand-ins for us. We need Jesus to wash us clean. We can't do this for us ourselves. Jesus is calling us to think of ourselves as having no status, no, zer- no deserving, no entitlement, just as he did. And we see this in Philippians chapter 2. Listen along, verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. It's by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so now we get down to brass tacks. Now we see that only Jesus has done this. Only Jesus became like this child that he's talking about. He made himself truly nothing for our sake to make something of us. Jesus is the one who humbled himself. We should be singing constantly, isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Eyes have seen, ears have heard, is recorded in God's word. Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful for having done this? And because of what he's done, being obedient to his Father, what does our Father do? Verse 9, therefore God exalted him, highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so the debate was already over before the disciples started arguing. Jesus is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He went to the cross for our sakes and calls us to trust in him. You see, that's the other aspect of being like a child. The Greek word here is paideon, and it's often used of very, very young children, like babies. If Jesus called one to come over, then it was at least toddling, right? Unless it crawled over to him. And at that age, you are nothing but need and inability. You need to have everything important done for you. But it, it, it is an age where you are dependent and you trust that your parents have you covered, that you will be clothed, housed, changed, and fed. And Jesus is calling us to be dependent upon him, not trusting in ourselves or our standing, but entirely upon Christ's finished work on the cross for us and his standing that he gives to us. That's what he does when he calls his father, our father. As Paul learned from Jesus, when you do this, in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Jesus told him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Then you can do what Paul does. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 
You know, John Morkin sh- uh, shared this illustration with me yesterday. That Queen Elizabeth, when she was a child, people would ask her, so who are you? And she would reply, I'm nobody, but my father is the king. Brothers and sisters, let us be as children, nobodies, whose father is the king. Because then, last point, we can humble ourselves and bravely go after the lost. See, what happens when you see Jesus this way? The true great one of heaven who emptied himself for our sake. John Calvin says that man is truly humble who neither claims any personal merit in the sight of God nor, profoundly de- nor proudly despises brethren, brethren or aims at being thought superior to them but reckons it enough that he is one of the members of Christ and desires nothing more than that the head alone should be exalted. To desire nothing more than that Jesus alone should be exalted. See, that's what Casting Crowns is singing in their song, Nobody. I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who saved my soul. Ever since you rescued me, you gave my heart a song to sing. I'm living for the world to see nobody but Jesus. See, that's a good litmus test for us. In our conversion, in our Christian lives, is our purpose to know Christ and to make Him known. It's the mission statement of our church, and it's a good one. And that's what verses 5 and 6 are about. Matthew 18, 5 and 6, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Now at this point, Jesus is not speaking just of just a, a child or his disciples, but all of us who trust in him. Jesus is including us in this number. We are his little ones. You see, he's changed the wording. Now it's not piety and child. Now we are micron, little ones. It's a term of endearment. We are precious to him, though we are little and of no standing next to who he is. And we see this word again, actually, in Matthew 10, 42. We've heard it before. Whoever, Jesus says, whoever gives one of these little ones, again, micron, even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, a follower of him, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. We are Jesus' precious ones, the ones he protects and loves. And that's meant to encourage us and give us bravery. But verse 6 is not about saying those who would cause you to sin. It's the word scandalon, right? Stumble. All right. So it's talking about those who would tear down his followers. Who would tear down his followers? Well, false teachers for sure, but also unbelievers. And so this is mostly then about unbelief. What is the fate of those who do not believe in Jesus? And he gives this horrible illustration, all right? You ever hear the term sleeping with the fishes, concrete shoes, so like the mafia? This millstone that he's, Jesus is talking about isn't the little hand one that people would crank to grind their wheat into flour. It's donkey stone. It's the gigantic one that fills up a room where a donkey has to go around the room and is taking out a whole mess of wheat all at once, turning it into flour. And Jesus is saying, it would, be, it would be better for someone to have that gigantic thing, that gigantic thing tied to their neck and be thrown into the, and then it's saying, the sea of the seas, or the, de- the deepest depths of the seas. This was actually a form of punishment, of capital punishment back then, drowning. Jesus is saying, the worst version of that is still better than what's in store for those who don't believe in him. Jesus isn't calling this out, saying, don't worry if people persecute you, there's revenge coming. He's calling us to have sympathy, sympathy for those who are still lost in darkness. 
He's giving us courage to do this. Again, Luke 22, verse 28, you, you are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you as my Father assigned to me a kingdom so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And Jesus is telling this to disciples, but telling this to all of us. Jesus is saying his kingdom is our kingdom, and his gospel message by which we are saved is our gospel message to share. He is ours, and we are his forever and ever. In fact, Pastor John asked me to do chapter 18, verse 10, too, because it's a really hard one. And you know how Pastor John likes giving me the really hard ones. Saying this uh, this passage, see, um, verse 10 says, see that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. All right, that is a little weird, right? But Jesus, so D.A. Carson says that Jesus is referring to how each of us, when we die, while we are waiting for Jesus to come back, we get to be with our Father in heaven. We get to see Him. That is how close we are to Him, how much He loves us. And that's not just those who have died and gone before. That is us as well. This is how precious we are to Him. Which means let us be bold. The God of the universe is our Father in heaven. So go out and share that love with others. We can sing, let's forget about ourselves and magnify the Lord and worship Him, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We can be like Paul. These chumps, the disciples were arguing amongst themselves, but Paul had them all beat. In pedigree, he had the lineage and education. He stuttered under the right people. The job, he was a Pharisee. The reputation, he was known for being tough. And he says, he gives it all up. He calls it garbage, rubbish, and gives it all up for being united to Jesus Christ. Because when you see Jesus is all that matters, then you see other people the way that Jesus does. Romans 12, 10, Paul says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. See, the person that's abandoned all concern for standing, saying, I just want to be found in Jesus, that person can go out and have fun in the game of outdoing one another in showing honor. Or verse 12, in Romans 12, 16, it says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Don't lord over others, even your greater understanding of the Christian life. Because in Romans 15, 10, Paul says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. And that's all of us who know Jesus Christ compared to everyone who does not. Brothers and sisters, this this time is an opportunity to share the gospel. Can you imagine what it means? Most Americans don't know their neighbors or don't know them very well. Can you imagine what it would mean for, to go to a neighbor, giving the right distance, but saying, hey, you know, just, I just want you to know I'm heading to BJ's, I'm heading to the uh, supermarket, can I get you anything? I, I really don't want you to go out just and endanger yourself. All right? Or what it means, hey, I've got all this toilet paper, so, just <laughs> so here's, a, here's a roll. I was just thinking about you. Let me know if you need anything else. All right? Imagine the love that your neighbors could feel. And then, what have you done? You've laid the groundwork for saying, hey, listen, if you've got nothing going on Sunday morning, my church does a live stream of, the, of a worship service. So it's better than nothing, right? And then, when we're finally done with all of this, maybe then you've just, you've just prepared the ground, you've laid the seed, and the Holy Spirit will water it, and they will accept an invitation to come to this church because they're so curious about how someone could be so generous and loving. All right, or Friday night, there were like 22 people, kids called in for a youth group with Tay. And at least one of them was because one of our kids invited their friend from school to call in. All right, can't we show this kind of love, this forgetting about ourselves 
And then, think about it, just this virus then winds up being an opportunity for us. We didn't have an excuse before, and it would be kind of awkward, but we've got reasons now. Everyone's full of need. And we, we have pure gold to share in the gospel. See, maybe you need, as I close up, maybe you need to make Psalm 40 a regular prayer of yours. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O my God. Maybe you need to remember, this is a time of fear. But perfect love casts out fear. So we know and we have this faith in our Lord, remembering who is in charge and keeping our eyes on Him. So I encourage you to make a personal application and go in this time and witness for Jesus. In this way, with humility, an arrogant Christian makes a lousy witness. But a humble Christian, following in the footsteps of our humble King Jesus, is a powerful witness. Let us boast, let us be confident in Christ and share Him with others. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you have not left us abandoned or alone. But you continue to give us your word, which points us to your love for us in Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we thank you for taking worthless ones as us and no standing, and taking our place, making of yourself no standing, and making us children, adopted children of our Father in heaven. Holy Spirit, we ask you to remind us of this reality, this truth every day, and give us the courage to share this with all in darkness. Thank you for this greatest of gifts and protection. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now, let's sing this closing song together.